Yeah. 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 All right, great. I'll let him. I'll go pull you around the table. Thank you, Matt. All right. Good evening. It is February 27th, uh, 2020. 2020. Um, this is the Council Rock School District Board of School Directors Education Committee monthly meeting. I'm chairing the meeting, Ed Tate, school board member, and we will go around the table and let everyone introduce themselves. So we'll get our health through Council Rock South, teacher. Alcohol, principal, Council Rock High School South. Christine Michael, school board. Dave Brooks, school board. Matt Fredrickson, IT director. Andy Sanko, director of K-12 education. Sue Elliott, assistant superintendent. Liz Potash, health and phys ed district coordinator. District curriculum coordinator. Um, Jackie Ockenhelm, um, health and phys ed teacher at South. Joe Hidalgo, school board. Jason Truscavich, assistant principal, Council Rock North. Susan McCarthy, principal, Council Rock North. Area of the school board. Splendid. Thank you. Um, as always, um, let's see, we would open the floor to any public comment if there is any before we start. Uh, hearing none, um, if there's any public comment after each agenda item, we'll pause. We'll also pause for comments and questions from the board. Um, I would ask that while people are presenting uh, for our two agenda items, that we hold questions until the presentations are concluded. And um, the first item on the agenda is um, we have also joining us school board member Ed Solomon. Um, the first item on the agenda is approval of new non-print resource material, Beautiful Boy. Dr. Elliott, would you take the meeting, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Page. So um, this um, approval tonight links to uh, Board Policy 109, which focuses on the approval of resource materials, including print and non-print resource materials. Uh, tonight, we are bringing you a non-print resource material. Uh, and as for the policy, we've established administrative regulations guiding the selection and approval of such resources. Um, Administrative Regulation 109-R-1 focuses on the selection, evaluation, and use of print and non-print resources. Within this regulation, the administration has developed clear guidelines around the use of R-rated films, and I'm going to review them with you here as they are in the slide. So one of the things that we note is that with limited exceptions, um, uh, to include R-rated films, it needs to be a film that's critically acclaimed uh, and is directly relevant to the planned course of study, which you will learn about this evening. Um, the film needs to pre be previewed and recommended for use by the teacher and the curriculum coordinator. The building principals approve the showing of the film, and as per the administrative regulations, we send a letter home to parents outlining the purpose of the film, and we require written parent permission to view the form, uh, view the film, excuse me, prior to showing it. So we will not show it to a student for whom we do not have written approval from that parent uh, for that student to be viewing the film. Um, if a student's parent, or in some cases, if the student wishes not to view the film, um, uh, the students without permission are excused from viewing the film without any penalty. Um, and uh, we also make sure, uh, as with R-rated films, our teachers are um, engaging in very um, thoughtful conversations and clear guidelines in the class about the focus of conversation and discussion and the purpose. Um, so the name of the film that uh, we are bringing before you this evening is Beautiful Boy. And I'm going to turn over now to um, Ms. Potash, our District Coordinator of Health and Physical Education. She's going to provide you with information about the high school elective course that this film is linked to, as well as the film and its use. Okay, thank you. Um, so the course that we would like to propose is our, Excel our, our Accelerated Senior Seminar Life 101 course. We thought it was important to give some background about the course so that we understood uh, where we would like to place it 
It is an elective course um, within our health and physical education program, and it is open to our seniors, um, our seniors only. Uh, it does provide a variety of information on health topics, and we listed some of those up there for you, units including diversity, healthy relationships, substance abuse addiction, to name a few. And we are currently running five sections of the course at Council Rock North and four sections of the course at Council Rock South. It is a primarily um, discussion-based course and uh, relies a lot on um, projects and interactive uh, pieces. And Jackie Ockenhouse is here tonight. She teaches the course, so you know she's here to give some perspective if you need that as well. All right, so we do use some movies. Um, there have been movies that have been a part of the course for years, as long as the course has been running, um, and they really allow students to make connections as to what is happening with a lot of the content that is covered. So it lets them gain some new perspective and make that connection um, to, to, to a lot of these important and relevant health topics. We had included a couple of quotes up there, um, and Jackie had brought them as well. Some of the, our students' final reflections when, they, uh, you know, when the course is coming to an end of their senior year, um, one of the things that they do ask about is some of the movies that they watch. So we pulled a couple of these out. Like I said, she has a couple more here with us. But we just thought it was important to you know, show the connection that students are making to the film. It says here the movie was by far the most eye-opening video I've watched throughout all of high school. Um, a different video or a different movie that is watched. This movie really put things into perspective for me and showed me how careful you need to be. And some things that you know we had talked about when thinking about trying to add a new film in, one of the things is that we want to keep everything relevant. So some of the films that we have showed, they're starting to get a bit outdated. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we had current um, videos to show. And also for our students who, you know, are visual learners and, you know, learn through that avenue. So there's a lot that goes into kind of that whole piece. If you're not familiar with the movie, um, the movie came out in, I believe, 2018. It's on the next slide. But it's a pretty unbelievable story. It is a true story. Um, it follows, it, it chronicles the life of David and Nick Sheff, and it is based on their true story. So the original book came out um, from The Sun. That was the first book. It was Tweak, and it talked about his own experiences with drug use and addiction. And then a couple years later, the father, um, followed up and wrote his own book called Beautiful Boy, and it was the dad's perspective on what it was like having um, a son going, battling through drug addiction. So this is a movie that came out, obviously, directly connected to them, um, and it really just follows his life story from high school to college and beyond. And the big piece about this movie is that it really shows the way that addiction impacts not just the individual, but those around them as well. So, I mean, the way that a lot of this comes up also is through class discussion when kids are sitting in class and saying to, you know, Jackie, for example, hey, have you seen this movie? You know, this could be a good connection for us. And this was one of them um, that came out of it, which is why we started to take a look at it. Um, as Dr. Elliott had said, we did review all of the regulations that were, you know, were, we were asked to examine. Um, the controversial material, it will be addressed through class discussion as well as reflections that the students will write. Um, it is rated R for drug content throughout and language. There is brief sexual material, and I think we referenced that um, on the next slide, but we are willing, that is not necessary to show. So we are always happy to edit out scenes um, you know, that aren't directly related to the content. And I mean, just like anything else that we do, especially in this course, because it is so much discussion-based, and we call it a Life 101 course that it's our seniors who are preparing to go off to college and whatever is beyond. Um, you know, there is a lot of conversation throughout. So all of those pieces will be addressed before, during, and then after um, viewing as well. We are looking to replace um, the movie Recommend for a Dream, which at this point is becoming a little bit outdated as it's from the year 2000. We want to keep our curriculum up to date with current times. Um, again, as Dr. Elliott said, all the R-rated films, parent permission is required to view the film. Um, it will be shown in its entirety, like I said, with the exception of we'll, we'll clip out one uh, piece due to sexual content. And we do have copies. Did they arrive? Mm -hmm. They arrived here at Chancellor, and then they're also, it's also available through Amazon Prime. Yes. Okay. So, questions um, from the board? Regarding this movie. What's your favorite place? Uh, the movie Requiem for a Dream. Okay. Um, and this movie overall others because... Uh, 
I mean, just when it's, when we are trying to find movies, we're really just looking at ones that will fit within the curriculum, mm -hmm. also looking at ones that are in the most appropriate content, and this is one that I do believe it was students who first uh, brought the title up. Um, they came across it on that <coughs> I took a look at it and really liked it, and it um, it just fits in really well, especially showing um, drug addiction from like a very experimental phase, which is something that some students would be able to identify with. But then also the kind of the more serious side of why they would need to really have their eyes open and you know, be aware of some of the risks that are associated with it. We well, answered it for me. If, you, if it comes from the students, that yes. that's that, yes. it's a pretty strong um, advocating. Uh, no, and I think one thing to consider too is we are constantly looking to update our films, and it's not that we're only looking at R-rated films. In fact, we look at all sorts of films. We have added, you know things that are clearly not R-rated, but with the topics that are covered in this course, I mean, a lot of times it does become R-rated films, and we've really tried to you know kind of funnel out movies that are just you know totally out there and getting away from kind of the central pieces and. The R-rated content in this one, I mean, as much as we like to say it's only language, I mean, we are talking about 17 and 18 year olds um, with parent permission. So for the most part, it, it really is, you know, mostly a language piece of that R-rated. Denise? Uh, so I saw the movie on Tuesday, mm -hmm. two hours. I have an hour commute. Watched half in the morning and half in the afternoon uh, on my commute. And actually, I mean, the, the, I watched the first hour in the morning and, um, this is a really powerful movie. Like this is, like it was intense. Like it was with me my entire day, and I knew I was going to watch the rest of it. And um, you know, it it touched on a lot more themes than I realized just in like the little synopsis that was given to the board about you know drugs. And, you know. I mean, because it just, I mean, it highlighted certain things. Like it, it really escalates a point about um, one time trying trying one time can you know change everything and, and the need for, you know, what it does to your body and your brain, um, the impact on the family. Um, and it was interesting because I was so moved by the movie, I just casually mentioned it to my 26-year-old daughter to see if she had seen it. And um, she hadn't seen it, but she was well aware of it. And it, it, it created between the two of us a conversation that I can only imagine if the students have that amongst themselves with the teacher um, at home. So I, I certainly think that there are incredible lessons in this, and so uh, I appreciate the heads up. Great that was on Amazon Prime, uh, because it really gave me a, a solid understanding of, of the educational benefit of what this movie is. So, um, thanks. I will say, too, and I said this to Dr. Elliott when we first started proposing this, if you like the um, movie, the books are unbelievable. Well, yeah. It's always better, I know. They really and are. Actually, I, I, that, I mean, I read it probably 10 years ago when I first read the first book, and I was like, wow, it really gives you a new perspective. My, my son is 31, and um, when he was much younger, he read the book, and we had a similar discussion to what you're talking about. Very impactful. I mean, even now, I mean, I watched it two days ago, like, it's, it's, it's so powerful. It's just, there's certain themes and things that even, you know, it, it's so relatable to whatever perspective you want to look at it, and so um, I, think, I think it's a great addition to the curriculum and a great lesson. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to watch it. Mm -hmm. it I gotta be honest, I haven't, I haven't read or read the book or seen the movie, but I have this 18 year old, so I applaud any time we're thinking a little bit outside the box to get to that. Um, too many times kids will tell you, I'd rather watch the movie or read the book anyway. Uh, maybe this will make them read the book um, and start something. Conversation amongst their teenagers are, are about things that are nonsense is very prevalent. Get them talking about something that it's home, and they can all probably relate to the contents of the movie. I applaud that. I think it's great. I think it's, this is what's exciting about being on the board here, seeing innovative thoughts continually go through our district. Thank you. Good job. Great. I, I did watch a good bit of it. Um, and it is literally dark. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the relationship between the son and the father. So that would be a great conversation starter for kids and parents. Um, I think parents ought to see it. Um, one of the reviews, I read a bunch of reviews, and it's really highly reviewed. One of the reviewers 
talked about the fact that she's a parent with uh, younger kids, but when they come of age, this is the kind of movie she would want to watch with them to start the conversation about drugs and addiction. And she compared it to another movie that you may have seen called Ben is Back, um, which is similarly tough. Uh, it's the subject of addiction as well. Um, but, you know, um, I want to ask Dr. Ellie about that one minute scene, and she said essentially just fast forward through it. Because it's, it's not. It's very easy to discuss one it's minute. It's not. Very, yeah. We've paused so many times to talk about something that's going on in the movie. We honestly, we can skip right over it, and the children won't even know that we've cut, yeah. edited it out because of how much we stop to talk about different things that are happening Great. in the film. Great. Okay, well, if there are no concerns or objections, I think we're generally supportive of this. And this is being well communicated to the parents. Yes. So there is a, um, a form that goes out. Well, there's a form um, even for the seniors to elect to take the class that they do prior to putting it on their schedule. And then um, in the fall when the students come back, um, we send out a permission form with all the movies listed. It's very clear that the parents are able to indicate that they have permission or do not have permission to see any of the R-rated films. Um, uh, and actually, I wasn't 100% sure if we would like uh, try send out another form to allow our students to see it this spring. That's what I would love to be able to do. Um, but we were just getting to this point before we, you know, we're going to make any decision on that. Um, but yeah. yes. But to answer your question, it will be well communicated um, with the parents that the purpose of the film and you know requiring the permission letter is something that's very important. Yeah. So that I have no doubt you will. But it's nice, you know. Yep. To have we have a long time recording this on YouTube, and we can refer back to this thing. <laughs> when Mom says, I never got this. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we keep them all on file, so yeah. after they have them all sent, they send them to me. Or and I, have them I apologize. <laughs> yeah. um, but no, I, no, this is great. Good to you guys. Good. Okay. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank Thanks for the support, everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the good explanation. Um, next item on the agenda. So the second item on our agenda this evening was to give the, the board and the community an update on um, our progress and the work that we've been doing with the rock block. So I'm going to turn that over to Andy uh, Senko to lead and um, work us through that update. So. <clears throat> Since our last reporting out of Rock Block, we've done a lot of work, and Susan and Jason and, and Bill and Al are here to talk about the work that we've done from our last reporting out, and you'll hear about how we've grown the committee, how we've gone out to do more visitations, and how we are looking at um, and spending time trying to uncover all the questions and, and find what the essential questions are in terms of implementing rock block. So with that, Susan, it's your slide. Okay. Um, can we move to the next, please? Thank you. So why, why rock block? I'm going to begin with a little bit of an overview of where we, um, we ended the last time we were here. Going back to the summer of 2018, it was the charge of the original scheduling committee to examine various scheduling models with the, the purpose of attempting to embed within the school day intervention and enrichment for students and also collaboration time uh, centered around PLC work for staff. After months of research, we landed on the concept of the unit lunch or lunch and learn or rock club as, as we're calling it. First and foremost, this, this opportunity um, is one which provides a plethora of possibilities for our students regarding uh, choices that, that they can make. And um, some of them would, of course, be intervention, which would be modeled um, on our current concept of our clinic culture. Um, but the difference, the major difference, is that it would be offered at a time when all students would be available to partake in it. Also, we have the, um, the possibility of enrichment pursuits. They could be academic related for individual students, 
or they could be related to um, the various um, other programs in our school that they may not have an opportunity to take in their, their regular schedule. For example, there might be um, some, some activities um, emanating from our business department or our family and consumer science uh, area, our, our tech ed department, um, art, music. So it would give students an opportunity to have a taste of some other um, courses that, that we are pursuing um, within our school day. We, we also have some um, possibility for students to form study groups with each other. Uh, frequently they're working on uh, group projects or you know, it just may be helpful for them to sit together to review for a test uh, or to complete an assignment that, um, that they can um, you know, benefit each other with if they, they have that time to do so. Uh, we also would have an opportunity for a quiet study hall for those who would prefer that. Uh, there might be some informal meetings of students regarding uh, certain clubs or activities that, that they are pursuing um, after school. Uh, there might be opportunities for test makeup. There would be opportunities for uh, athletes to make up missed work uh, where they may have a difficult time, especially in the spring, getting back to see their teachers. Uh, we have the use of a library available for students who, who currently really um, make use of it during their, their current half hour lunch, uh, which is you know, problematic you know, when you look at it in a math perspective. We have uh, time available for students to see counselors, which again frequently happens when students are already in class. Uh, there might be time for a pickup game, uh, some, some relaxing activities, a uh, pickup game in the gym or a workout in the fitness area, um, you know, maybe uh, to do a walk or a run on the track. And some schools that we had observed had uh, taken it to, to a more extreme level as far as having you know, Jenga areas in the school provided or uh, ping pong tables, which, which we have that in our phys our ed department, uh, foosball tables. So, so there's a lot of possibilities. And I think uh, something that, that we would be keeping an eye on is, is maybe future uh, possibilities as far as um, looking at a, a sequential cyclical pattern of uh, a more structured program. We could even incorporate uh, some initiation to the high school setting for ninth graders or student wellness activities for all students, uh, personal finance or um, you know, getting ready for life beyond the high school. So, so it's a model that, that has a lot of potential to do a lot of good things for our students that we currently uh, are not able to fit in very easily. Um, one of the other major impacts of, of all this would be to hopefully provide a less stressful time for students to experience in the middle of their school day. We just, as a district, attended a very comprehensive presentation on the concept of trauma-informed classroom. And one of the, the components of that was um, something called a brain break, where students have a time just to um, you know, get away from everything that they've been doing to refocus, to regroup, to rewind. And um, this is what we're hoping to do as well, uh, hoping that in the end, students will be more productive for it. So um, that is sort of what brought us up to our present time. Bill, I think you're going to take us into the current. Yeah, so what, uh, what the committee's been up to uh, up to this point, as Andy said, we've expanded it uh, quite a bit. Uh, we've done a number of uh, number of visits, um, included students from both the high schools, 9th, 10th, 11th grade, have all been on visits to uh, both Harrington and, and uh, Unionville Chatsford High School. And a huge thanks for that. They've been more than accommodating for us as we walk through with herds of people into those buildings. <laughs> they've, they've been terrific. Uh, the kids at Unionville, I think, are very used to business. We were, we were walking through a hallway, and I was walking with their, with their building principal, past a bunch of kids, and said hello. And one kid goes, oh, look, more lunch and learn visitors. So they, <laughs> <laughs> they've gotten very used to seeing people come to see what this, uh, what this concept looks like. Um, so that's what, from a visit standpoint, that's what we've seen so far. Uh, the, the takeaway, at least from, from Unionville, which is my most recent one, 
last year, Andy, Andy and I and, and, and Susan were at Cherry Hill. Uh, I think the one big takeaway from you, you know, is everybody commented about the, the how de-stressed the kids are and how valuable that break is uh, for them. Uh, we talked to the kids about it. Our kids that went with us, first thing they said, uh, first thing that stood out to them is everybody was just, kids were kids were great. And, and, and we had a good chance to talk to a lot of staff as well, and it's the same thing. From the people that were in favor of it from the beginning to a handful of people that didn't, that weren't really sure about the concept when it was presented to them, who, who now just absolutely love what they've seen so far. So. Yeah, I would say, I mean, my two observations, I also attended the uh, visitation at Unionville. My first impression is it's very far away. So, <laughs> yeah, it is. About an hour away. It's in Belmore. So we actually had a, a big yellow bus and for a visitation meeting. <laughs> so uh, 202 King of Prussia area in the morning rush hour, I don't recommend that. But I got out there, gave my second impression. Is there any video of this? No, thank you. I'm going to take credit for it though, because I drove it the first time. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, you guys don't want to do that again. <laughs> but I believe it is close to the mushroom capital of the world. Yeah. Yeah. So it is amazing that smell permeates everything. Mm -hmm. really does. And, and I was kind of every room I would go in, I was looking for something, and they were just going about their business. But just to piggyback on what Bill said. Um, a couple things with, I think we have very broad uh, stakeholder representation, which is good. What we're looking to do now, since potential implementation would be 21 22, is we need to get the seventh and eighth graders involved. So that's our next step. For in terms of, yes, for committee work. So we, we're not as accustomed to it at the high school level, working with the younger students in terms of soliciting their input, but that's something we need to do because. Those are the kids who are going to be impacted. Those are the kids who will have four years if we go ahead and do this. Um, yes, sir. When I had a question uh, regarding the makeup of the kids, how many went, and uh, how did you get their feedback for us to maybe digest, you know? We had, on our trip to Unionville, Joe, we had uh, two North students, both sophomores. Freshmen and sophomores. Freshmen and sophomores, and, um, and a girl from South and with us. Um, as far as how we got the feedback, we had three students. three students to Unionville, and then the Harrison trip had another. I don't know what their number was. Three, I think, we had an 11th grader from the north, definitely Harrison. Okay. And I'm not sure if there was to South. I'm not a little. Yeah, there was. was. Yep. And Brianna was our 10th grader at Unionville, so um, she'll all be like the student executive board on the trip. And we're going to start that. And that's going to be one of the future slides here. We're going to talk about how we're going to kind of scale this. And, Broadcast it, you know, broadcast it out to the larger community. But Brianna said of the trip to Unionville, I kind of met with her afterwards and got her feedback. Overall, she really liked it. She thought it would be super chaotic in terms of what's this one hour going to look like. And she said it actually flowed very naturally. She was very impressed by it. She also had concerns. She had like an adult concern um, about what happened. If uh, my parent has to come get me during that time, they're going to be able to find me. And what the Unionville administration told us, and, and we saw it play out, the kids tend to migrate to the same spots. So the principal said, we actually have a better feel for where the kids are during this hour. Not that you don't have an outstanding feel when they're in a classroom, but it wasn't an issue for them. So that they were able to locate kids very quickly to be big. I was just wondering if there yeah. was an opportunity to have more kids and more feedback than just six students yeah. out of the whole. Yeah, so as Al said, <clears throat> in terms of growing the stakeholder group, we've already kind of laid the groundwork to start involving student leaders from both middle schools, and then it will expand from there with, with um, actual um, participation of kids and surveying of kids uh, at that level who will be impacted um, in living this if we were to move forward with it. Yes, I think the students seeing it in person is really going to, the more you have doing that, going back and talking to their friends, the more you get to move forward, that it trickles up maybe from there. So part, part of that. I kind of talked about the students in North, so the students in North, three students did meet. There's also a student voice committee that's currently running in North, so we had five students. So the three students who participated in the site visit 
did share out to that group because um, we had one that went to Harrington um, who was very not biased to the point that they were hesitant to be part of the committee because they're like, I don't know who this for getting We said, that's why we want to They were emailing us before they even got back to North that particular day saying, I can't wait to talk to you about what I saw today. It's just a great experience. Um, and then two students who wanted the union bill shared out, they said it was a high school musical. They said they went into there and it was such a comfortable environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, the moment they stepped foot, they were so excited. They were hoping that it would start next year. Mm -hmm. uh, so those three students and the student boys actually shared out to our student council the following week. Again, we give them a lot of information, and like Alex is going to be sharing kind of where we'll be going with it. Yeah, I think that kind of analogy is powerful. And you have more of that kind of feedback. One of the points of the conversation in our last committee meeting, the discussion was we ideally we would like to put all of our kids on that big yellow bus and get them to see it and know realistically we can't get all of our kids to Unionville or Harriton or anywhere anywhere else. But we <coughs> talked about ways and ideas of how we could get the experience to our kids virtually. Mm -hmm. So that's still up for discussion, but that was a talking point the last committee meeting. Unionville had to put together a uh, uh, a video that they that they rolled out to the community and the students over the summer. Um, beginning of the school year, Union, this is Unionville's first year doing it. Um, so their kids had a, had a good look at what it was going to be like and had a good experience. So from a committee standpoint, to put something together like that is something that we're already talking about. And I've done some research as well. If you look at different high schools in the area, really South Jersey is really moving towards this unit lunch. A lot of the different high schools have videos really showing outside community what's happening during that. Uh, it may not be exactly what Council Rock designs to do much for, but at least we'll give them a taste or a flavor of having you know, 55 minutes to an hour to do what you need to do. You know, have that accountability, um, have the option of seeing your teachers, seeing your friends, de stressing, great break, all that involved. In so. so, so we talked about, you know, so logistically it's a little bit challenging. Having been on the receiving end when the visitation teams come to see, Council Rock High School South, as as Bill mentioned, sometimes you know you almost have too many members, so it's it's difficult. But there's no question that these visitations are super impactful. So obviously, the more students, the better. But we've got to try to scale that a little bit for the few students that practically can go on these trips. Okay. Yeah. So the other thing that the students said uh, in terms of uh, access to counseling, I think Susan mentioned that, and Laura would be our CARES coordinator. They felt that that period of time, one hour, was outstanding for accessing the counselors. We had eight guidance counselors at South, and I think there's seven or eight at North as well. Very busy guidance suite. And in terms of making appointments for a whole host of things, whether it's social emotional well being, whether it's college planning, uh, oftentimes the students are making those appointments and missing instructional time. So to have this one hour block of time, where students can access their counselor, uh, they thought that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, same thing with the Student Assistance Program Coordinator, just in terms of, and that ties in obviously very nicely with, you know, social and emotional well-being, just to have that access for the adult advocates. Um, so that was, we, we had an outstanding trip there. I will say, in fairness, those two high schools are smaller than our schools. So uh, Unionville is about 1,400, and Harriton runs in the 1,300 range. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, it was it was an outstanding visit. I think the challenge for our committee and what we worked on next, and we're going to get to this in the next slide, was what are the essential questions that we need to answer to implement this well in 21-22? What are the things that we have to find out about, grapple with, uh, potential obstacles that could ultimately become opportunities? So here's our list. So for example, safety and security. If we had a lockdown or a fire drill during this unstructured unit lunch time, what do we do? So obviously, you know, we're pursuing our Alice initiative. What would that look like during this one hour period of time? So that's a question. I have a question because um, Susan said something before, because she mentioned the kids go on the track. Will kids be allowed to go outside? Is that yeah, so I think the only 
non-negotiable that we've answered so far is that we will have a closed campus. That is, students won't be allowed to leave campus. However, we are talking about taking full advantage of, for example, some of our outdoor eating spaces, courtyards, and things of that nature, which would mean that students, yes, they are outside <coughs> campus, and that's why. I love that. That's, yeah. I don't know how you're going to manage it, but I mean, I <coughs> think in terms of like the brain break and whatever, fresh air, mm -hmm. outside, I, I just think that it's mood enhancing, it's uplifting. I think so that, that, I'm sorry, no, I think great. one of the best comments I heard on that concept, I think it was Susan from North, one of the students said, can we go out in the winter because the elementary students do it. So I can't That's a good point. And especially yeah. with okay. the that was you, right? We got that. I did, yeah, but it wasn't I, I can't take credit. It was the uh, principal at Unionville who said it. I was quoting him. So yeah. I mean safety security and structured time. So structured time would be uh, you have a one hour block of time. So for staff you're looking at basically a half hour for lunch and then a half hour for and how would they spend the time? Obviously in remediation and intervention. But would you also want them potentially meeting with their PLC colleagues? Would you want them maybe meeting with some department time? Would there be some supervision for perhaps that test makeup test area or uh, supervising the gymnasium? So those are things that we have to work out because all of those things really involve a multi-cycle schedule. Right now we have day one, day two schedule, but we'd have to kind of have a little bit more than that. Either a four or six day cycle, something, something along those lines to have that schedule rotate through at Unionville. Every department had one of the days on their six day rotation. Mm -hmm. It was not department time, basically collaboration time, but more along the line, in line with, with the PLC work. Um, and each department, whatever day that was in the rotation, that, that department was available for the, for the learn time the remediation and enrichment time for the kids. Uh, the day we were there, I think it was worldwide. Have we determined that this would eliminate the days where kids go in late for the PLCs? Or is it separate? I don't think that we've fully determined that yet, but I think that's definitely something that, as we look at this, that we'll need to consider. Do we need to have that um, late start for our, our um, high school after we implement this? Let's, let's try to, um, I want to try to get through the presentation before we get off track. Um, so, um, okay, third so we'll down. Sure. This is a big one, student accountability, so this has to do with, you go to this? <laughs> this has to do with, uh, in, in terms of like attendance taking for the students during that one hour block of time. And this was interesting because Unionville kind of has one take on it and Harriton Lower Marion School District, another take. Um, in, Unionville, in Unionville, they really preach student empowerment, and you can do what you think you need to do during that one hour time. So if you want to eat for 45 minutes, you've got a remediation for 15 minutes, or vice versa, that's what you do. If you feel like you need a brain break and you want to shoot hoops in the gym, that's what you do. Student empowerment, good decision making. Uh, at Harriton, they have a little bit of a modified system in that if you are falling down, so to speak, academically, perhaps you have some Ds and Fs and some academic courses, they mandate that you go to remediation during some of that in a block time. So, and, and you, you can see kind of the full spectrum of possibilities there in terms of student accountability and whether we want to do that or not do that. So that, I think, is going to be really uh, something that the committee grapples with and tries to solicit as much feedback as possible, because that, that's going to really uh, be a big driving force as to what this is going to look like. One of the other schools that we visited, their, on their accountability piece, um, when the students were not, and they had a very structured system, uh, the kids were assigned either for first or second lunch, wherever they were on the other, on the other half of that hour, they had to sign in or log into whatever room they were in. Uh, Union was the exact opposite of that. The kids were wherever they wanted to go. As out, and the principal had told us that they wanted to find kids. They kind of knew where everybody was. 
um, but they left it open for the kids to decide what they were. They did use it though as a um, as a discipline issue as well. So if it was if it was somebody aside from the academic part of it where they were where somebody was missing out on work. If it became a discipline issue, then you then a student could be assigned a place. If they had to go, they were assigned to lunch. They were assigned to the discipline room where they would spend a, kind of like a you know, a, a one hour in school suspension. Thing. It was very powerful. Kids doing what they wanted them to do because nobody wanted to miss out on that hour with their friends. Highlight of the day. Um, and then the last bullet point: lunch logistics and guidelines. Just to give you a quick example of that, one of the schools. Uh, instituted and implemented a rule that if there were if there was carpet in a room, you could not eat in that room. So if there was tile, you can so things like that in terms of uh, how to utilize the physical space, what the rules and regulations are going to look like. That's just the practical logistical uh, element that we're going to have to grapple with. Now we're going to keep keep going with the presentation. Are there any kind of questions? Yeah, always, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so the next set is kind of a broader overview, uh, but we'll go down pretty specifically here, um, looking at this implementation timetable. Um, really from beyond this meeting, uh, one of the key things that's come up a couple of times already is, you know, we've educated a small number of individuals that are part of this committee, you know, a handful of students, a um, handful of staff members who've done these visitations, we've had some sharing out through council meetings, but we need to Use the education of all our stakeholders uh, working with the students in the council meetings, both the school and extending that uh, morning announcements, faculty meetings, putting together like FAQs of what are the reasons behind us going with the unit lunch. And again, putting together some type of video for like that virtual, get that feel. This is what a unit lunch looks like in these different schools. This is possibly how it's be implemented in the Council Rock school system and give the students some general taste of what the unit lunch is. Then after that information, that's when we can really start gathering important input and feedback from all the stakeholders. Because they're very asking particular questions of them before they have any understanding of what it is, the information is valid. So after the educational piece, putting out surveys to the students, to the staff, and to the community, kind of getting their input of how do they see the students utilizing this time? How do the staff members see themselves utilizing this time? And we can collect that information in addition to other questions that we may have, such as, you know, what is the role of homeroom currently? And how would this be impacted if we don't use homeroom in the future? Or even looking at the exchange times between classes, one consideration is to go from five to four minutes and adjusting that in homeroom time that we can actually increase and retain as much instructional time as we possibly can in our six period deck. And once we have all this information, then we can really start formalizing those particular action items for implementation. And kind of everything that you've heard right here, there's are a lot of questions that we have. You know, looking at student accountability, looking at safety features, looking at areas in which we're going to be eating lunch. Um, the committee can really start working on those key topics and have as much input as possible to make a, you know, a decision that is the right decision for both Council Rock and School and itself. Um, after that is going on, there's other things that need to be started looking into the future. One is looking at the potential bell schedules. Really looking at it minute by minute, what is the schedule going to be from 7.33 to 2.15 with the unit launch, without term, with four minutes, but also looking at two-hour delay schedule, three-hour delay schedule, keystone testing schedule, early dismissal schedule, all those other schedules that are out there that a lot of times we kind of neglect and forget about. And that really needs to be looked at this spring because a lot of publications that are going to come out for the 21-22 school year actually start getting worked on this summer and early fall. Now, finding all the publications that have our bell schedule, you know, the program planning guide that coordinators are working on this summer, they have finalized in November, uh, looking at our student handbooks for the following years, faculty handbooks, and I'm sure there's a number of other publications out there that have this particular schedule, so we need to research our websites Etc. Make sure we have everything checked so we know if this is proved that we can make these adjustments in a timely manner um, for the implementation. So that's what we're looking at from, from now through spring and into the summer. Starting next year is really the opportunity for us to really get in front of a lot of people and share this information. Because having it on a website is one thing, sending out email messages, 
another, but when you have that face-to-face -face communication with individuals, it, it means more. So it's more valuable information. If you think about the start of the school year, you know, we have back to school. You know, we have a large number of families coming in, and both high schools can take that opportunity to meet with the families, in particular, um, of really, you know, the current 9th, 10th, and 11th graders, this is the potential, and these are the different features of a unit lunch um, that we are looking at as well as meeting with the students. They're getting information one way, but now they can hear it at their grade level meetings um, and continue in that. And then all the information that is shared out to all the stakeholders can be now posted on like a, a hub on the website, very similar to what we have for the redistricting hub, um, with our late start time hub. All the information that is shared is collected in that one point for research for any individual who's unable to attend any of those meetings. Then moving into the winter, again, finalizing that rotation, like Al said, putting together a schedule in which we're having a cycle in which staff members have the opportunity to meet and collaborate um, in a timely manner. Uh, because I think, you know, we talk about PLCs, they should be meeting approximately once a week, and how do we fit that into our particular schedule? Determining all staff responsibilities. So a lot of this, we're focusing on the teachers. But again, we're looking at counselors. Are they going to be available and finding our own schedule? And all of our support staff. You know, we have support staff that are working one-to-one -on -one with students. We have others who are supporting classrooms. You know, what is their duties and responsibilities going to be during that particular time of working with the different you know, collective bargaining groups and setting this up properly? Um, one feature is, you know, how do we educate the students um, the following year? So a lot of planning needs to be done early on, looking in that beginning of the year. Now, this is new for all. A lot of school districts may have an orientation or a transition program just for the incoming ninth graders, but we're going to be looking at doing something for all students at the beginning of that school year. And how does that look for the ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, 12th graders, and do we extend it for any particular grade level? Do we incorporate a longer period of time for ninth graders so they become more assimilated to the high school? And we have that opportunity for them to work with their peer mentors or their rock ambassadors for an extended period of time. So assisting them in that transition to the high school. And then determining all those student options that are available. Yes, we're aware of the lunch, we're aware of the lunch and lunch, we're aware of the, you know, enrichment, remediation, you know, or sort of physical activities, and we're going to have different programs going on. Um, in the elective areas, we're going to have creative centers allowing the students that may not have that particular elective to work in those certain departments have to be created. And this is the opportunity also now to really start working with those middle school students who are moving up. Because in January, that's one of the first times we have that face-to-face -face contact with the middle school students with the program planning. So we meet with them in January, we meet with them again in May, we move up day, and then during the short, uh, summer orientation. So that process will start there working with the particular student. And then in summer, it is finalizing those key logistical components that we have to be ready for. You know, one you know, simple example of the signage. You know, how do students and staff know who's available each day? You know? Or they available with learn one or learn two that we saw at Union Bill. It was a very simple way for students to be aware of so, um, online, like a Google Doc, or something similar to that. So students are able to log in every day and see which staff members are available for a learn, which staff members are unavailable because they have department meetings. Certain districts have their attendance secretary actually tell staff members who are out for illness or some other reason unavailable so students don't unintentionally you know go to that particular area where they're alert. Also certain areas where we want to close certain areas because of poor weather. You know, so that documentation has to be created uh, for that summer. Working with Chartwells and Aramark and really finalizing those key components, uh, working with Doug Taylor and the summer construction projects. And then all these changes that I talked about different bell schedules, they also need to be put into eSchool really more towards you know, the beginning of the spring so we can work on the schedules and the schedules can be ready to go when they are released at the end of that summer. And then fall 2021, it, it's go time. Um, really working with those transitional programs that we set up and determined, communicating with all stakeholders again, giving them an education of what the unit lunch is and then collecting feedback as quickly as possible and several times throughout that beginning process because there are things that are going to work in other school districts but may not, may not work in our own particular school that we may need to adjust throughout that time. So again, there, you know, we're talking right now, this is very small, but there's a 
lot of work that's going to be going on over the next you know, year and a half to make this work in So, <clears throat> So our hope is if we are moving forward with this to get board approval with a target uh, date of fall or winter of 2020. Um, and you know, we just spoke about the school start times and this work with the unit lunch is, is contingent um, um, upon the work. It's, it's linked to but not contingent upon the school start time work. And if we are moving forward with both these initiatives, they will be implemented at the same time. Um, we'll provide the board with a review of the cost for the rock block and start times in the fall of 2020 to help make informed decisions. The end. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Joe? I'll, I'll work my way back with just for the last the timeline and looking at the board approving something in this next fall or when, sometime in the winter. Um, so there's a whole collective bargaining aspect and the finances that we're not even, when is that going to be uh, uh, given to the board? The finances of the rock block? Yes. Yeah. So or they're trying to combine with both. Well, if you remember at the November Ed Committee meeting, we did present an overview of the cost of rock yeah, Lung. I that, but so that's, that's it. That's what we're going to go off of in those estimated numbers. Of numbers. Yeah, so if you look at the third bullet point up there that Andy yeah. went through, so we're going to provide the board with a review of cost for both rock Lung and start time. Right, so that's one in the third. fall months. You know, and at that point, we might not be narrowed down on exactly <coughs> this model or that model for start time. But we'll be able to say, hey, here's the low, here's the high, here's the range of what we could be talking about on start times, here's the range that we could be talking about on rock law. And then, so if that's happening in the fall, then we're really going to be looking for that board vote in, say, more quicker. That's what we're talking about in summer. So, so a couple of months January. January after the fight. Yeah, to get enough time to, to understand not just all the concepts around the programs themselves. <clears throat> and the moves, but the finances and those those sort of rent off the as well. Okay. Um, should I continue just to ask my three questions? Yeah, does anybody else have? Um, I have two questions, guys. Um, I was wondering, I know this was covered in one of the previous meetings, but we were looking at what some of the other districts had spent. And I remember there being a district that seemed to not spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously it's, it's different um, and we you know, have different buildings and populations and but I didn't know if there would be like any more work try, trying to like look at those best practices or looking at um, because I do think um, I think this is great work and I really would love to see this move forward but I think the cost is a little bit of a barrier and so I think if there is a way to you know just try to as we're looking at fall and winter, um, you know, to look at, at maybe what those other districts did, if there were, if there are any ways to try to just trim and you know be mindful of of cost and, and think about you know some even even some ways to um, involve the community if that makes sense you know so I just didn't know if in a month like that that you know great timeline if there were also some other things. Um, that related, you know, to those areas too that were part of it. Yeah, I can speak to that piece of it. I mean, you're, you're spot on with it. It's the same conversation that we've all been having at the table, the committee, and so on and so forth. I think what you're probably remembering is one district in particular, really a couple, but one in particular. Um, these districts, the difference between them and us from a custodial staff is that they're approved in house, whereas obviously we use their work. So um, in, in digging into that, and Doug is the main person who dug into that, and several conversations, and so I'll share this back and forth. Um, that was a pretty pivotal piece to it. When you look at, okay, here's what they have for the high school, and again, we're talking about different size. High school is what is all ratio. So here's what they have, and then here's what they had to add. Uh, here's what they didn't have to add. Um, here's how they pulled it off. Uh, and then so what we 
been doing over the past several months is going back to Airhub and saying, hey, here's what it looks like, here's what we want it to look like, and continuing those conversations. Uh, so obviously we're dealing with, you know, some Airhub issues beyond this right now, so we'll let all that play out. But uh, yeah, it's very much important to be on the story. I just want to comment. Yeah. I mean, obviously, the finances are ultimately going to drive this, but I'm so impressed. I, I'm so impressed <coughs> with the work and the thoughtfulness and, like, looking in every direction. Of, I mean, the the, the considerations that you demonstrated you're looking into, I mean, it, it's so thorough and so thoughtful, and I, I'm just really impressed. I want to thank everybody for their hard work, and I hope we can afford this. I think it's so good for you. Yeah, that was my comment as well. I wanted to thank the committee. Obviously, you've done a lot of work, and you're taking into consideration kind of every aspect of what needs to be in place for this to be successful. And I definitely see the value of it, but I agree we need to look at the numbers, and I hope we can afford to do it. I really believe this will be so good for our kids. Yeah, I, I think it sounds brilliant, too. And um, it's, I wrote down a size question before you all brought it up. Um, uh, and I, I think, um, I hope in our research we make sure to look at, and you probably may already have done so, maybe Cherry Hill qualifies in terms of comparable size. But I think it's important that we make sure that this has worked in high schools of comparable size. That's my only suggestion. Um, and uh, I would be interested if you <laughs> run across anybody uh, who has some real legitimate concerns or reservations, any districts that looked at it and said, no, thank you. Um, it looks almost too good to be true. I think it makes perfect sense. It's incredibly logical, and the benefits look terrific. I just want to make sure there are no stones that go unturned. But I think it looks like a marvelous concept. So I, for one, had to be convinced. Um, I, had, I had gone to many, many school districts on visitations and was not impressed by most of what we saw until we went to Unionville. So I That's right. You, didn't start, you all didn't start out this process looking at block lunch no, no, lunch. No, no, no. no, that was a part of what we were seeing. Right. So so we refocused our our um, our view of things. The other the other thing is so much of what you see when you go out has to do with the facility that exists. For example, we went to Hunterton Central because they have more students than we do. Mm -hmm. And our thinking was, well if they can do it for 3,000 students, then we can certainly do it for, you know, 2,000 students. Um, Hunterton Central, though, had two buildings. They had their 9th and 10th grade centered in one building and their 11th and 12th in another building. So it, they had really, it, it didn't work the same way mm -hmm. as, as we do. And, and every building really had its own special characteristics that lent themselves way that district was able to enable what they had to happen. Thank you. Uh, I also think it's incumbent upon the committee to ask the hard questions. Yes. Uh, and not that we're necessarily trying to poke holes at things, but you know, no one can, can really argue about student power. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. You know, letting kids make decisions and ultimately the vast majority of our students are going on to the college and university level and want them to self advocate. And a lot of this actually, I've heard the comment from other students that say it looks like a student union almost, you know, which, which is a good thing. Now, the, the negative, though, which I kind of am kind of grappling with in my mind too, is well, how about that student that isn't perhaps as good or have the, as those self-advocacy skills uh, refined as much as some other students? They're going to need some help, and so we're grappling with what's that going to look like. How can we perhaps utilize peer mentors to assist those students? Should we structure their time? Uh, should it? What, what, sh what should that look like? So I, I think those are the questions that the committee is really going to have to um, hone in on 
early this next year and, and, and really consider all the students. Um, because, yes, it, it almost does sound too good to be true, and I think the vast majority of positives during that one hour far outweigh, in my mind, um, the potential obstacles, but we have to be very mindful of those obstacles. I, I remember you bringing up before the idea that there are some students that might find this mm -hmm. unstructured environment to be challenging, yes. and I think that's really great. Well, I just want to say, I re reiterate what the other board members said, it's a fantastic idea, it sounds great. I'd love to see the students get on board as much as possible so get them exposed to it and on board. I, I tend to believe that's where the power is in the, in the students and, and the community. Um, I really look, really appreciate the information that was, was presented tonight. Uh, in your committee research, I was hoping or wanted to know, with, uh, taking into consideration district programming, uh, student population, I'm thinking this would be actually a really great uh, opportunity for them to integrate and I'm sure that's part of your research but I'm thinking there's a big opportunity there for extended flight clubs and things as such. It, it is and, and we have certainly involved um, representatives from our special aid uh, arm of the district and um, to Al's point a little bit earlier, we have students right now that don't function well in our current setup and we make modification adjustments for them and that's part of the conversation that we're having with um, students who may be in district level classes or students who just, that, that environment that we offer now, with, uh, several hundred kids in the cafeteria, it doesn't work. Um, but the, the, the follow up to that is then what? What's going to work for them? And that's the questions that Jason and Al spoke about, you know, honing down and drilling down to, to find out what that answer is. Or a student who has a a one-on-one -on -one during that time. What does that look like? May I? A uh, quick question. You know, one of the key areas that you know, we need to continue looking at is safety and security. And I'm just curious whether any conversations have already occurred with um, local police, firefighters, or is it too premature for that to have happened already? Uh, it is premature at this point. We have, we have raised the question about um, you know, fire and police and mm -hmm. egress and those kind of things, mostly with the conversation with Doug Taylor and the work that he's done, but, but we know on that, it was one of the first bullet points of the essential questions is the safety and security, <clears throat> and that would include, you know, identifying spaces students can go and eat so they're not blocking an egress or, or, or something like that. Are we in violation of any fire code? So we still need to get answers to questions like that. Other questions, comments? All right, I have one. Yeah. The schools will be visited. Are they for the first year relatively doing this? Union Hill is the first year. Uh, Cherry Hill was in year. I'm not going to hold you. Six or seven. Harrison yeah, they, was here for. Year. So I think my question is this. Are, are they managing and critiquing themselves through this process? Yes. Um, and then the schools that have done this already, I'd like to hear what negative feedback they got no. in terms of anything. Logistics, it's, it, I don't want to say it's not working. You know, it's things that they pulled away the first year that we can look at, because I'm always cut back the whole thing, um, and, and look at the negative things. Because it all sounds great, but there's got to be negatives out there. And that's, and that's the things that I think sometimes is overlooked because we think things are too great. But they're critiquing themselves. What are we doing? And, and to Mary Ann's point about security, you know, that's part of our threat assessment that we do with our neighbors. Um, you know, I'm very, I'm very interested on how we're going to cover key areas of the outside of the school with cameras, staff. We're going to revisit Alice in the event of active shooters. Uh, outside, inside, what are we going to get to for these kids? I'd like to hear some of the things they work through in, in the negative aspect. Uh, the absolute thrill of the year. One of the things that um, was evident in multiple visits in terms of, you know, viewed as negative is that behavior notices, office referrals increased the first year. In, and I think we mentioned that at one of the previous presentations um, is students and staff were getting acclimated to it, the uh, office referrals increased. Um, and that's with 
you know, a school like uh, Unionville who's new at it, somebody like Easton that have been doing they've been doing it for you know decades. Yeah, and that was. I think the best practices are a good idea. I mean, I'd also like to know: Did we see a reduction in in, in, in students cutting, not showing up to class, taking days off? So that because you, now they have that time to relax and adjust accordingly. To that, to, to that exact point, and, and even the teachers. Yeah, this, this, the we the, the, the staff. students at Unionville said the one thing that they had seen drop and again. They were in year one, so we saw them five months, four months into this right. process. The one thing is they had seen a decrease in our kids studying class yeah. uh, because they knew they were going to have that. Out. See, I think that's important for us to figure out, find out, and talk about because that's what parents want to hear about. They want to hear about how it will positively affect their children. And it's easy to say we're going to give them a, a brain break, but studies are shown, we have seen, that we know that. Metro. Uh, <laughs> yes, they're hard to find. Them, but no, but I think it's, I think it's important because if you go ask somebody what you're going to do for an hour, uh, you're going to get ten different answers from ten different people. And sitting through Council Rock for a student advisory council, Joe and I had done it like two months ago. And in and in, and Mr. Block, there was that was a, that was a lot of questions. And you guys did a nice job with it, but there's a lot of questions out there. The kids have a lot of questions. I know the parents do. So. So I just just put that in the back of your mind. I, you know, I'd like to see that type of angle looked at as well. Well, I think it's great that we're having all this conversation this far out. Uh, I think it was really smart to have, some, you know, early presentation plural. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Public questions or comments? No. Um, hearing none. I think we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.